Let me thank the Royal Institute of Philosophy for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, as well as a pleasure. Um, what I want to talk about today uh, is rather general, namely the content of emotions, what philosophers call intentional content, though the word is unnecessary for my purposes. Um, the thought behind it is that unlike a simple sensation, an emotion is said to be about something. Fear of a cat, say, is about the cat, but it's specifically about uh, uh, the dangerousness of a particular cat or the, uh, the presumed dangerousness. And I found that some rather recent authors uh, identify content with object of emotion, but I think there is a distinction to be made. There are different ways of being about something. Fear of a cat, which I'll use as my example throughout uh, until uh, almost uh, to the end. Uh, fear of a cat has the cat as its object, but uh, its content amounts to what it means, essentially, or what it says, what it, what it signifies about its object, namely that the cat endangers oneself, uh, it's potentially harmful, something like that. And what I want to, in the past I've, argue that the content of emotion is evaluative, but not an evaluative judgment in the sense of a belief. It needn't be believed, and I'll say more about uh, that later, but I'm not going to repeat my arguments for that point here. Um, instead, I'll try to explain how the view I came up with, what I'll label uh, here, the evaluative affect view, and I'll even abbreviate it as EA, uh, how it gets between the two main alternatives in the uh, current uh, philosophy of emotion literature, uh, emotions as evaluative judgments, and on the other hand, emotions as perceptions. Uh, I'll explain the views a little more on a later slide. Uh, and then I'll go on after giving you some background. I won't assume that you know all about this, though some of you may. Uh, I'll go on to outline a way of making the object content distinction that uh, seems to, to clarify it um, and allows, if you, if you identify content with object, then uh, you can't say that the content of emotion is evaluative unless it's about some evaluative object. So the cat is not an evaluative object. Uh, so uh, uh, certain authors who, that I've read with a class re recently, Deona and Taroni, who, who identify content and object, I think this must be from psychology because uh, uh, it, it pertains to authors uh, very familiar with the cognitive science literature. Uh, Deona, Deona and Taroni, on the, uh, on the basis of identifying content and object, end up saying that emotions have no evaluative content, though somehow uh, the criteria for the, uh, their appropriateness or correctness uh, is, a, or the criteria are evaluative. Uh, but their content is just, in the case of fear of a cat, say, the, the, guy, the object, the cat. So I'll defend a distinction, and then I'll go on to do something, to work on some stuff that's new to me, but uh, forces me to clarify some things. I'll consider some of the recent evaluativist views of pain that seem to uh, have some morals for emotion. So here are the two competing views of emotion. Uh, you can view emotions as evaluative judgments, beliefs, uh, e.g. that the cat is, in da is dangerous or specifically is a danger to oneself. Uh, or perceptions, and they take seriously, at least the originators of this view, uh, take seriously the analogy to sensory perception, but by contrast, these are emotions are perceptions not of objects, 
but of values or disvalue. Uh, fear amounts to a perception of danger. That's a kind of disvalue, dangerousness. So those are the two main views. I should mention some examples of people who hold them. Um, the evaluative judgments view is Robert Solomon's view, most notably. An earlier author, Bedford, I think, uh, held this view in the 50s. And uh, most recently, that I know of, Martha Nussbaum defends a version of it. Where the perception or perceptual view, uh, D'Souza, Ronald D'Souza is the main proponent, and uh, uh, someone named uh, Tapolet, Christine Tapolet, in, in also, also in Canada, uh, holds this view. Okay, so besides being contrasted in the current literature, they're critiqued. Um, that's why I want to get in between them for something, a, a tertium quid. Here are objections to the evaluative judgments view, and I'm not mentioning all of them, but just some standard objections. Uh, there are emotions. Of, uh, one example is a phobic fear, fear of, a, of, a, of a, maybe it could be a cat. Uh, I used the example of a dog earlier that you know is harmless, but you had a traumatic experience with it uh, at some point, and so you still experience fear in its presence. But you don't believe that it's, that it's a danger, at least that's what I've argued, and others take that as an objection to the evaluative judgments view. And also, now some people take this as an objection to my view too, but I will defend against it later on. Uh, but it does apply apparently more forcefully to the uh, evaluative judgments view. Animals and infants pretty clearly display emotions, but they don't seem to be advanced enough cognitively to make evaluative judgments. It's been argued they don't have concepts. <coughs> uh, a bit more about that later. But uh, now the uh, perceptual view does manage to answer those objections, but it's subject to a few objections of its own, basically variants of worries about the perceptual analogy. It's meant to be a perception, a, an analogy to sensory perception, uh, and it's strained at best. One, the first thing that's usually mentioned is that uh, there's no, or, there are no organs of emotional response in the way there are of the physical senses. Um, so it, the analogy seems questionable, but more specifically, and the people I mentioned before point this out, Deonia, De, Deona and Taroni, um, though you can have perceptions that match or fail to match reality, uh, they can be veridical or illusory in the usual terms, they can't be justified or unjustified in the way emotions can uh, because there aren't reasons for them. There's, they're about something, they're of something, but uh, uh, emotions, uh, even if they get it right, uh, are about something that is uh, real. Um, you can have or fail to have reasons supporting them. So, uh, emotions can be justified or unjustified. So the perceptual view seems to have some problems too. Well, what I suggest, well, a, a little history. Um, when I first, the, right now, at this point, the perceptual view seems to be dominant, sometimes with qualifications about the analogy to sensory perception, but that seems to be uh, the view that's favored. Now, when I started working on this subject, the main contender was the evaluative judgments view. So I began by working out a modified version of it that weakened the uh, judgment to a thought, uh, and, but claiming that it didn't have to be believed, it just had to, be, uh, just had to occur to you. Um, and the view I came up with sounded like, 
to many people a, just a weaker version of the value of judgments view. But what I had in mind was that the evaluative element was, was what the, the, the affective, as I call it, or feeling ele, uh, aspect of the emotion was about. Okay, so uh, it's about an evaluation. Um, and now the language I used, as I'll point out later, but it may have been misleading, but I, I referred to it as an evaluative thought or even proposition. But it's, it's what the affect is about or directed towards, the feeling. And so the resulting view actually comes closer to the perceptual uh, approach. Um, emotions as perceptions of value. One thing, I did mention this as an objection, it's not really a standard one. One thing I don't like about the view it, is that it seems to be committed to a kind of realism about value. If, if you are able to perceive it, it's out there. And I may agree with that. I'm not sure. Uh, it depends on what comes with it. But, but I don't want to tie a view of emotions to uh, some particular view of value. So I think the, my view gets in between the horns. I never named it before. I think it'll actually be maybe a little more salient if I do name it. I'll call it the evaluative affect view and abbreviate it as EA. Um, it's an intermediate view and it uh, affects as a plural. I'm, not sure uh, is quite acceptable. So I uh, say it characterizes emotions as evaluative affective states, states of feeling. So that fear, say, amounts to discomfort, to use a very general term for it, that the object of fear is dangerous. So you have an evaluative uh, object of the feeling component, which I'm just going to call discomfort. I'll mention later, uh, but I might as well say it now. I used as a neat verbal opposite to discomfort, comfort, but that doesn't quite fit all positive emotions. So don't take that terminology too seriously. Um, EA denies that emotions have to involve judgments or that they're analogous to sensory perceptions, but instead takes their affective component, uh, I, I should correct that I now prefer to say element, as about evaluations of their objects. Oops. So to go over it in a different way a bit, uh, According to EA, the evaluative affect view, an evaluative affective state, like discomfort, registers the subject's positive or negative evaluation of the object of emotion. Now, my main focus, for reasons that, if time permits, I'll explain more later, is on negative affect or discomfort uh, since it's a st state that uh, motivates uh, escape, at least in the usual case. Uh, and normally, the, you can escape emotional discomfort by falsifying the evaluative proposition it's uh, directed toward, oh, say, by moving out of range of a feared object so that it no longer endangers oneself. But besides not uh, I'm taking this for granted here, not always amounting to a belief, the evaluative propositional content, that is, it can be spelled out as that the cat is dangerous or whatever, doesn't have to be explicitly held in mind by the subject of emotion. Um, and I'll say more about that as I proceed. Here are some misinterpretations, and I take a little uh, uh, I attribute some fault to my first pass at this subject with uh, an awkward terminology. I use language like entertaining a thought, uh, an evaluative thought, 
or holding it in mind to convey uh, the contrast to believing it. And that led some people to think, well, I'll tell you in a second, uh, to think that it was a separate uh, uh, thought. Um, and I had this regimented talk of comfort or discomfort for the affective, and I said, component of emotion. That seemed just to refer to an associated experience of pleasure or pain. And other writers on this subject were aware of the evaluative judgment views connection to Aristotle's definition in the rhetoric, say, of anger uh, as uh, a reaction to a slight to oneself or one's friends uh, accompanied by pain. So it's, uh, which makes it sound as though there's a feeling that is tacked on to an evaluation. But that's not what I really meant, though some readers apparently took me as maintaining that the subject of emotion separately entertains the evaluative thought in question. And I don't want to say that, really. And also, some readers couldn't make sense of affect being about something, uh, having an evaluative object. So the more misinterpretations, again, uh, attributable to uh, awkward language, which I hope I can now improve on. I re refer to the evaluative component of emotion as its internal object, meaning that it's the object of discomfort internal to the emotion. But some readers apparently took me as uh, saying that that was the object of emotion, so that fear of the cat would be fear that the cat is dangerous. But that's a different thing. Um, what I had in mind was just that uh, fear of, of the cat amounts to discomfort at the thought that the cat is dangerous. And it, uh, in fact, if you take me uh, as uh, taking an evaluation as what the emotion is about, you get particularly implausible results for some more complex emotions. For instance, I understood love as, at least under certain circumstances, involving a, uh, uh, an element of discomfort, namely discomfort at a distance from, at being at a distance, about being at a distance from the love object. So it has a negative element, but clearly being at a distance, uh, Evaluated, evaluated negatively, that's not what one loves. Um, and even if you consider the, the central, I would think, positive uh, element of love or manifestation of love, uh, that, the positive evaluation of the object of love, that's, you needn't always love having that, uh, e.g. in cases of unrequited love that you wish you were not affected by. So uh, this was a misinterpretation that skewed what I have, that seriously uh, distorted what I had in mind. It's not the object of emotion that's evaluative, except maybe in some cases, but not necessarily, but rather something internal to the emotion. Well, I would now put it uh, somewhat differently. That, that wasn't meant to be underlined, but, uh, but uh, italicized. What I'd say now is just that the evaluation in question spells out in a propositional form uh, the evaluative content of the emotion. So forget my talk of objects in earlier work. But now I need to say what the difference is between an object of emotion and its content. And since, as I said, uh, some recent authors uh, identify them, conflate them. Um, besides Dione and Tironi, someone else I've noticed uh, is Valerie Tiberius in a, in a uh, textbook on moral psychology that otherwise looks interesting. Um, I mean, that it's interesting even in that way, but I think it's wrong-headed. Uh, there is a distinction to be made, and I would make it on, by analogy to Fregian 
sense versus reference. Um, remember, or hear for the first time, that uh, Frege took either language or a mental state as having an object of sorts, a referent. It, re Frege in Sinnum Bedeutung, Sense and Reference, uh, says that uh, the reference of uh, a term, say, in the first instance, is what it refers to, uh, the, analogously to an object of emotion, I want to say, but uh, its sense or meaning depends on how it refers to that object, its mode of representation in his terms, mode of presentation, I meant to say. Uh, his example was the two phrases, the morning star and the evening star, both of which refer to the same <coughs> entity, namely the planet Venus. <coughs> so to use my cat example, actually to spill it out a bit, I once had a cat who became violent towards guests and eventually towards me, but for a long time it was just guests. Uh, he would sit, she would sit lovingly in, or apparently lovingly in front of them as if she wanted to be petted. And if he reached out and tried to pet her, she'd hiss and snarl uh, a swipe. Um, so I might refer to her either and I, or both as my beloved pet and as my attack cat, at least until she started on me. And by the same token, uh, love and fear of the cat, two diff very different emotions, uh, refer to the same object, the cat, but they involve different evaluations. Uh, they have different evaluative contents conveying what the feeling, I would even say means or even says though a linguist friend I know objects to any non-literal use of says, says in quotes, here I say signifies or expresses is another term that occurred to me. Uh, the, what it expresses about the object is an evaluation, but two different evaluations in the case of love and fear. So what about my cat's emotions? Uh, after all, when, uh, it said that that reaction, even though she sits right there, sat, she's long gone, um, sat right there and tempted guests to pet her, uh, her reaction, she, the hissing and snarling certainly indicate an emotion. It's usually considered a form of fear that the cat is expressing, though it's a hostile kind of fear. Um, but it might seem, on my account, to, to involve a level of cognitive development that is beyond what a cat can muster. And even and also that makes questionable the application of emotions to human infants, which again, like animals, definitely seem to have emotions. Um, but what I want to say about the cat is that in reacting as she did, the cat evaluated uh, guests as a threat, okay? Uh, there isn't a, she doesn't have to have entertained a proposition, certainly, which cats are, if a proposition depends on having concepts, as is usually held, some, many would deny that a cat would be capable of, of entertaining a proposition. But uh, though I spoke of emotions as having a valuative propositional content. I did not mean that uh, one thinks a propositional thought in undergoing an emotion, but rather that its content can be spelled out or represented in propositional form. And it wasn't meant to de deny emotions to animals and infants. Uh, and in any case, personally, I am not so sure that, uh, that cats can't have concepts, uh, at least of a, a rather basic sort. But uh, in any case, there's work mainly over here, I think, on non-conceptual content. It's typically uh, applied to perception. 
So you know, you don't have to have concepts in order to to have content, of, according to this view. So maybe that applies to animal and infant emotions. And for that matter, some inarticulate adult human emotions. We can't always spell out what it is we're feeling. Well, I should take a breath. Uh, I hope that gives you an idea of the uh, lay of the land, so to speak, because I now want to think about something that's actually rather new to me, uh, the pain, uh, recent literature on pain. Uh, or the literature is new to me, but as I'll go on to point out, I've had the experience that it, it draws from. Uh, so uh, these are cases of, uh, that question whether pain is necessarily unpleasant, whether pain uh, implies discomfort on the basis of some rare but possible cases uh, where pain, uh, the subject is aware of pain but doesn't uh, feel bad, okay? He's not in a state of discomfort. And the one that's usually mentioned is a, a, a new term to me, asymbolia, but a, a term I'm familiar with that Wikipedia at least identifies uh, asymbolia with dissociation. Uh, these are states uh, that uh, typically result from an anterior cingulotomy uh, as a treatment for chronic pain. I also read that it can be used for OCD and the like, so I, and I imagine it would have the same results, whether, whether or not intended for one's experience of pain. But also, it's a, it can be a response to various drugs. Wikipedia mentioned certain types, it said, of morphine. Uh, so w there's one explanation of this that, I, that connects to views, evaluative views of the content of emotion. It's sometimes referred to as the evaluativist view. And I know it from Peter Carruthers' work. He's a, he's a colleague of mine. Uh, but I gather there are people over here working on it, um, perhaps for longer. David Bain is one at Glasgow. And Michael Ty. As I say, this is new, new stuff for me, but I get the gist anyway. Uh, and that is that you need to evaluate pain in a way that uh, asymbolics are not doing, uh, evaluate pain sensations as bad. That's what it means for them to feel bad. Well, in general terms, I think this lends a kind of support to uh, the kind of evaluative view I take of emotional affect as uh, emotional affect. Um, but it also raises, um, I guess I wouldn't, now say a complication. Uh, but first I'm gonna take a little detour and give some testimony about the pain stuff because I've experienced this in a dentist's office. Uh, a dentist trying to repair a botched job by another dentist. So I was uh, in a state at that point where I requested uh, laughing gas, as we called it when I was a kid, I think adults call it that too, uh, nitrous oxide. In fact, I've learned since from a student that William James wrote up his experiences on nitrous oxide, but he wasn't in a dentist chair or experiencing any pain. Instead, he had various thoughts on metaphysics, uh, uh, particularly uh, Hegelianism. Uh, I don't know enough about Hegel to, uh, to have those ruminations. But anyway, I was mainly concerned with what sounded impossible. The dentist told me that I would feel pain. And, uh, I was ready to say, oh, just pressure, as sometimes dentists tell you. But he, he assured me I would, would feel pain, but it wouldn't bother me. 
So I was eagle-eyed, so to speak, in, uh, to very intent on confirming this, and damn it, he was right. Uh, that was pain, but for a long time, until working on this talk, uh, as I'll tell you in the next slide, I could not say what it was that made me decide that it was pain, uh, what features, and there are different theories. Some of the current authors suggest that uh, pain, even when it doesn't feel bad, uh, even when you don't evaluate it as bad for you, uh, is itself an evaluation of damage to the tissues or something like that, disturbance. But uh, that didn't really fit what I saw the dentist as doing. He was correcting such damage. Um, disturbance, well, huh. uh, he was definitely monkeying with things, but, uh, but compared to what the other dentist had done, it uh, was a positive uh, thing he was doing. So that explanation didn't quite fit. Now others say, and for a while I was tempted by this, <laughs> but I wasn't totally satisfied. Others say that to experience pain without uh, evaluating it as uncomfortable is just to experience certain sensations, sharpness or uh, some other qualities of pain. Uh, but I really wasn't aware of noting anything like that. I just could see or feel or whatever that it was pain that I was experiencing. Well, while ruminating about this talk and waking up, so I guess I was in sort of a tra trance state uh, from a deep sleep one morning, the answer occurred to me, though it's not gonna make things sound any less puzzling, uh, it hurt. That's what made it pain. It just didn't hurt me. Uh, I evaluated it uh, as discomfort, but I attributed it to that person in the dentist chair that I knew was me, but wasn't, wasn't feeling the pain, well, I can't say that, wasn't having the experiences of. And that's what association involves after all. Um, I would love to ask other people, a symbolic, say, what their experiences were like, if they remember. Um, but I, I detached myself from experience, split off from experience in the way dissociation implies. Um, and it's the sort of thing that's exhibited in what's now called uh, dissociative identity disorder, but unlike myself, in the, uh, seeing that person in the dentist chair, uh, these cases do involve identity confusion. I knew that was me some, in some sense, but uh, this is the uh, psychiatric classification that used to be labeled multiple personality disorder, except that it didn't fit certain cases, uh, more typically male cases, that involve not attributing uh, the, the uh, traumatic experience that typically is to a, a distinct personality made up to, made up to take it. Um, but just seeing the trauma as happening, but not to oneself. That's apparently a more typically male way of, but, uh, but classified as the same kind of disorder. Uh, of responding to trauma of a sort that makes more typically females form, form multiple personalities. So, it, it, though it doesn't, though it sounds still weird to say it hurt, but it didn't hurt me, I, I, I knew, even though I knew that was me, um, it's not so different from cases that are recognized. At, now, of course, those cases are psychotic, I guess, but, uh, but I was under a drug after all. So anyway, enough about me, uh, or at least my pains or, or discomfort. Uh, it does force a complication, namely, there may already be a negative evaluation as, disc, as unpleasant 
uh, involved in labeling something pain. My, my memory uh, while waking up is hardly scientific evidence, but I would love to, I wonder if anybody asks these subjects they're talking about what they th thought of as their experience. Um, but so th what's missing is a kind of self-evaluation. Uh, that what's missing in these abnormal cases that's present in normal experience of pain is what they call unpleasant pain, what I call discomfort, the evaluation of oneself as in a bad state because of it. Something like this, I want to say, is also involved in emotional evaluation, which a number of authors make a point of describing as self-involved, uh, the evaluation uh, as self-involved. The, the term is due to Robert Solomon, but William Lyons is another person who stresses uh, that the evaluation has to, is particularly in connection with oneself. Uh, when you think of it, I could evaluate during the period when it hadn't yet attacked me, I could evaluate the cat as a danger to, just to my guess and feel something about it, worry or concern for my guess, but I wouldn't thereby necessarily be feeling fear or fear of the cat anyway. Okay. But there are more complications when we apply this to emotions. Now, uh, I noticed that in my abstract, I promised you a consideration of two different ways of dealing with a certain problem that I'll relay on this slide. But actually, working further since I wrote the abstract, I narrowed in on one. So I'm, not, I'm just going to give you one way of dealing with this complication. The thing is that uh, unlike pain, at least as usually conceived, and in normal cases, emotions have external objects like the cat. Um, so whatever evaluation is involved in uh, making your pain discomfort also has to evaluate the uh, object as, as dangerous. Can, can you have both at once? Uh, well, first, the analog of pain sensations would be the particular what are called symptoms of the emotion for fear. It would be a pang of fear or various elements of, the, um, read, of readiness to flee, like sped up heartbeat and uh, shortness of breath and so on. But as I say, if the experience of those symptoms as discomfort uh, involve, involves an evaluation of them, how can it also evaluate uh, the cat, the object of discomfort? Uh, yeah, sorry, the object of emotion. Well, thinking about it, I just decided that sure it can. Uh, though it's, you have to express it rather complexly, or I do anyway, uh, the evaluation of the emotion symptoms as discomfort depends on seeing them as triggered by factual features of the object, uh, the cat, say, uh, that would support the relevant evaluation of, of the cat as dangerous. So for fear of the cat, uh, I perceive it's sharp claws or know that cats have sharp claws uh, and teeth. Actually, the cat I was talking about uh, had been declawed. That might have been part of her problem. Uh, but typically teeth, along with, I mean, typically claws, uh, along with perception of its uh, past and present behavior. Um, when you think about it, uh, sped up heartbeat and the other fear symptoms aren't uncomfortable in themselves, but only at, at, when you're aware of them as danger responses. Uh, it, they're seen, as I say here on the slide, as signs of danger or something bad, uh, like danger. Uh, 
And it's because of that that one evaluates them, because of that evaluation uh, of the external object, that one evaluates them as discomfort. And this doesn't mean that uh, there's a causal relation between a prior evaluation of, of, of the cat uh, and then you experience your sensations as discomfort. It all sort of happens at once. And so uh, since I'm now calling the uh, affect and evaluation elements of emotion. I tried to get a chemical analogy, but it didn't quite work uh, for, I, I would love a better term if any of you can think of one, but tightly bonded elements, I guess I can call them. Um, the, what I'm saying is that the evaluation of emotion symptoms as discomfort involves negatively evaluating uh, the emotion's objects uh, uh, on the basis of its perceived features. And this doesn't have to be a separate evaluative thought. I ruled that out earlier. So animals and infants can be capable of it too. And also, unlike what I gather is at least some of the pain literature, uh, students' accounts of what Carruthers has in mind, for instance. I wouldn't make out discomfort as something separate uh, from the symptoms. When they are evaluated uh, negatively or, or as feeling bad, it's not that you impose an evaluation on them. Rather, they amount to discomfort. Okay, so I think Carruthers seems to have it that uh, what feels bad is the evaluation, not the pain uh, in the pain case. But what I would want to say is that the pain feels bad in the normal case where you evaluate it as bad. Now, that's not to say, as the chemical uh, uh, people, the, uh, the uh, a uh, friend's possible future daughter-in-law was said uh, was consulted about this. A colleague. Uh, uh, this is not to say that they can't be prized apart. Apparently, elements. Oh, it's always possible to separate bonded elements, though some are more tightly bonded than others. So don't think of this as uh, a claim that. They can't exist in isolation. The, the pain, the, uh, the pain, the discomfort, or the, for emotions, the symptoms, the discomfort, and the evaluation of the object, they're part of a single integrated response, I want to say. Um, and the result is something that can't be a causal account of emotion. And I think. Uh, some of the reasons that there has been misunderstanding of what I have in mind is that there's a tendency to see it that way. Uh, actually, the earliest philosophical view uh, that I encountered on emotions was Hume, who, uh, with a very atomistic account, it's it meant to be uh, causal, and the intentionality is explained in terms of causality, I encountered that as an undergraduate, and I, I found many things to admire in Hume, but not book two of the treatise where he talks about <coughs> the passions. It seemed like a lot of billiard. Of course, it was association of ideas that he was uh, uh, expanding on uh, and constructing emotions out of. But it, as I would have put it at the time, it, sound, it seemed to be a lot of billiard balls bouncing off each other. So that's not what I wanted, uh, uh, and may, uh, maybe some confusion results in a tendency to think that must be what one would be trying to do by distinguishing uh, elements, or as I earlier said, components of emotion. Uh, now I use the word elements, but even that is, can be misleading. Again, I'd love a better term. The friend who consulted his possible future daughter-in-law, the chemist, um, 
of, of suggested aspects. Uh, that's nicely vague, but uh, if you like, uh, and vague is in, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to allow for intentionality. An aspect uh, uh, being about another aspect of the same thing. Uh, how maybe, maybe, maybe I just don't, uh, maybe, maybe it can allow for it and I haven't, uh, I'm, ha I'm having trouble thinking of it that way, but, uh, but uh, I didn't like aspects. Now you might wonder why I'm bothering to analyze something only to say that its parts are not distinct uh, from each other. Well, what I had in mind originally when I started working on this subject, having forgotten about Hume uh, and my desire for a contrast to Hume, um, what I had in mind was to give an account of what might be called the logic of emotions. And I'm still working on the role they might play, and I say do play, in practical reasoning reinforcing the non-emotional reasons you have for action. Um, so for that purpose, it was helpful to be able to consider something judgment-like, if not necessarily a belief, uh, an evaluative propositional content of something that might count as a reason or a, a, a step in an argument. So the distinction I had in mind between affect and evaluation was meant to be logical or conceptual, not at all causal, and for that matter, not metaphysical. So these are parts in the sense of, of conceptually distinguishable parts, affect and evaluation. And the result you get is that uh, emotional discomfort, uh, perhaps this is the best way of putting it, embodies an evaluation. I'll still say, I think I can still say that it's about an evaluation of the object of emotion, but it embodies it. Uh, that's what makes it discomfort, or part of what makes it discomfort. Uh, the symptoms of emotion are constituted as discomfort by what the discomfort is about. Signs of danger in the case of fear. And of course, when, there are many other examples, but I think having one example uh, to work with can help. If time permits, I'll say something about positive emotions, but uh, my, claim, my main claim here is that we need both elements of this double evaluation uh, of one's feelings, but also of the object of emotion to explain what a psychologist call the valence of emotion, that is their, their uh, positivity or negativity, depending on the emotion. Uh, practically all emotions seem to have this, an, an exception that's sometimes cited is surprise, which can be uh, nasty or, or, or good, uh, but I'm not sure it's a single emotion. Uh, it, at any rate, it makes sense to to divide the negative from the positive instances of it. Oops. So uh, my initial purpose had partly to do with uh, motivation. Given that you naturally want to escape discomfort, uh, the negative evaluation of your own feelings can explain how fear and other negative emotions add motivational force to a cool judgment, e.g. of danger. But I do have to uh, revise one aspect of my earliest view um, on the basis of the pain literature. I tried to pick out um, discomfort just as a state that one would naturally want to escape or avoid. But I, I, that was, a, or not yet, but uh, that was a motivational criterion. That's how I re referred to it. And it partly was meant to broaden emotional discomfort beyond 
simple pain, uh, but also to allow for agents, um, not asymbolic agents, but agents experience discomfort, not to be motivated to escape it, e.g. for religious reasons, pain is uh, an act of worship or some such thing, or maybe a kind of guilt where you, or just a tendency some of us have to dwell on uh, negative stuff, ruminating and so forth. Uh, so maybe there are cases where you want to uh, be uncomfortable, emotionally speaking. So I wanted to allow for them by saying a, a state one would naturally want to avoid. But the problem is that uh, if you take these asymbolic cases, cases of dissociation seriously, uh, it would, it, their pain would still count as discomfort because it's still true that you would naturally want to avoid being in that state, but they uh, are in an unnatural state without their uh, whatever it is, uh, anti anterior cingula, whatever it is, uh, because of the unnatural, or because of the drug or whatever, it's still true that uh, they, that one would naturally want to escape what they're experiencing, even though they're not in a state of discomfort. Okay. So I don't take the motivational criterion to uh, give a sufficient condition of discomfort, but uh, I'm still thinking of it as a, as a necessary condition. Uh, one could easily substitute an evaluative criterion in line with the pain literature. Uh, an evaluation of experience as, uh, one's experience is bad, okay. And I can end with this slide as a summary, though, if time permits, or uh, maybe I'll post these slides, maybe you'll ask me in the question period, I'll say something about why I'm not talking about positive emotions. Um, as I've said, you, these, these aspects or whatever they are of emotion can come apart. But normally they go together just as pain normally is unpleasant. And the view I take, EA, a valuative affect, is meant to connect feeling bad with evaluating something as bad of, so that unpleasant emotions have at least some element of motivational force. In a nutshell, that I think is the difference uh, from positive emotions. They don't push you, okay? And, and, uh, but there's more to be said about ways in which they do motivate. They don't push you towards intentional action to, uh, uh, though there may be indirect ways in which they encourage action. Uh, they don't have the same implication for a motivational force. Also, I want to say that my view, EA, leaves room for lots of cases where uh, a negative emotion, which, it, as I take it, involves an element of discomfort, is part of an overall state of positive feeling. Uh, for instance, the fear you might experience at a, at a horror film, and I do consider it fear, um, is enjoyable on the whole, right? You quickly realize that you're safe, or you, you always believe that, even though the images in front of you gave rise to a thought of danger. And a romantic yearning, that's a kind of discomfort one can, one can dwell on in a, what, sort of a positive way, it enhances one's view of oneself or the relationship. It can be, it can feel positive on the whole. And in some cases of anger, you can be, you can love being mad at someone or, or be enlivened by it. So it's not such a straightforward contrast, but 
Uh, but uh, the treatment of positive emotions is really a uh, longer story. Thank you.